As is frequently observed in Dickinson's oeuvre, I dwell in possibility features a first-person speaker, often interpreted as Dickinson herself, who resides in a realm of potential, of possibility. This possibility is metaphorically depicted as a domicile for the speaker, a notion reinforced in the second line by calling it a house. Moreover, this house is described as fairer than that of prose, signifying its superior beauty, justice, and truth. The invocation of prose aids in elucidating what the speaker means by possibility. Prose, encompassing novels, short stories, and essays, is seen as ordinary written or spoken language distinct from poetry. Given that this is a poem, and considering the frequent opposition between poetry and prose, it becomes evident that this poem contemplates the essence of poetry itself. For the speaker, poetry embodies possibility, and this is the domain in which she resides. The alliteration of possibility and prose accentuates the contrast the speaker draws between these two literary forms. The lines exhibit a consistent iambic meter. I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose. The first line comprises four iams, thus classified as iambic tetrameter, while the second line contains three iams, making it iambic trimeter. This pattern, known as common measure or common meter, is prevalent in Dickinson's work. The speaker continues to employ this pattern throughout the poem, ensuring that its rhythm, sound, and structure constantly remind the reader that this is indeed a piece of poetry. Lines 3 and 4 extend the metaphor of possibility, that is, poetry, as a house. Prose, again, serves as a metaphorical house but pales in comparison. The poetic house boasts more and superior windows and doors. Windows and doors admit light and air into a home and facilitate movement in and out. Windows offer perspectives on the external world, allowing views from within. Hence, Poetry's numerous windows suggest that it provides diverse perspectives and insights into the world and into the poet's soul, allowing both poet and reader to peer through these metaphorical windows. The assertion that poetry's house possesses more and better windows and doors implies that poetry, as an art form, offers greater space and freedom than prose. It allows for more movement, more breathing room, an expansive imaginative space for readers to navigate. It also permits more light, symbolically associated with insight, knowledge, and understanding. This expansive possibility is what the poem seeks to celebrate. The poem subtly suggests that prose is inherently more limiting than poetry, though this is more about extolling poetry's virtues than criticizing prose's shortcomings. The lines are replete with assonance and consonants, emphasizing that this celebration of poetry is itself a poem. More numerous of windows. Superior, four doors. The sound patterning highlights how poetry differentiates itself from prose. In poetry, words carry different weight, with readers attuned to the interplay of sonic qualities and meanings. Through abundant patterned sound, the poem exemplifies what makes poetry unique. The caesura in line 4 introduces a brief pause, as if the reader witnesses the act of poetic creation, with the speaker momentarily pausing to contemplate the next verse. In the subsequent stanza, the construction of the speaker's poetic house continues, describing its rooms and roof. Line 5 uses a simile to liken the chambers of the poem house to cedar trees. Cedar, 
a symbol of strength and beauty in the Bible and one of North America's most durable woods, suggests longevity. The mention of Cedar implies Dickinson's belief that her poems would endure long after her lifetime, despite her limited publication during her life. Dickinson frequently uses quatrains, and the four-line stanzas here may evoke the four walls of a room, indicating that while poetry offers freedom and space, it also possesses a structure that supports it. This structural support, akin to the restrictions of poetic form, can stimulate the imagination in ways that prose might not. The phonetic similarity between chambers and cedars, achieved through consonants and assonants, evokes the density of cedar wood, subtly reflecting how each word in poetry is meticulously chosen for meaning and sound. Line 6 metaphorically compares the strength of cedar to the speaker's house of poetry, describing it as impregnable of eye. This difficult line suggests that poetry, while needing the eye for reading, offers the speaker a cherished privacy from society's prying eyes. Dickinson's reclusiveness is mirrored here, as poetry requires more than mere visual scanning, it demands imaginative effort. Lines 7 and 8 introduce the roof of this poetic house, which is the sky itself, signifying that the sky is the metaphorical limit for poetry. Describing the roof as everlasting links poetry to the divine and immortal, with enjambment between lines 7 and 8 suggesting uninterrupted space, reinforcing the boundlessness of the poetic imagination. The final stanza turns attention to the readers, referred to as visitors, who are the fairest of people. The speaker admires those who engage deeply with poetry, bringing it to imaginative life. This fairness in readers mirrors the earlier description of poetry as a fairer house than prose. The poem Sizuri pack meaning into small spaces with the Sizura after visitors emphasizing that the term fairest applies to those who engage with the house of poetic possibility. The speaker's occupation is the creation of poetry, witnessed firsthand by the reader. In rejecting expected gender roles, the speaker situates herself in a house of poetic imagination, focusing on creative work over domestic duties. This radical positioning argues for the vital role of poetry. The final lines underscore this. The spreading wide my narrow hands. To gather paradise. Writing poetry is likened to gathering paradise, portraying it as a divine art with the poet as a conduit to the divine. Line 11's length, fitting the image of spreading wide hands, highlights the speaker's physical commitment to her work. This image suggests both humility and determination to prove herself as a poet. The enjambment between the last two lines implies purity and limitless creativity, with the speaker resolutely answering her creative calling.